That leads me into our sermon today. Uh, we're going to be going through the book of James, if you would turn there. Uh, we're going to be uh, starting a new series. Um, I think we got another, yeah, James, book, James, book of James, Wisdom for the Everyday Stuff of Life. Wisdom for the Everyday Stuff of Life is our series. Um, I think we're going to take this series all the way up to Easter or Resurrection Sunday. I think somewhere in there we're going to take before we uh, get through this book. Uh, it's going to take some time. I was going to go through, like, I said, Pastor Andrew, you know, I'll preach chapter 1, and you preach pastor, chapter 2, and I got past verse 4, and that was it. There was enough sermons to stop there that you don't even have to go past, you know, uh, go any further with this book, because this book is is amazing in itself. Um, and uh, just let's, let's look at this, and I'm, I'm going to read uh, verse 1 through verse 4. It says, James, are you there? Yeah, James. Little book in the chapter one, and we're gonna go with verse one. Praise you, Jesus. It says James, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Or steadfastness in some Bibles. And perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. Let's pray. Father, I thank you again for the opportunity to be able to stand here and minister your word. Father, I ask that you use it this morning to challenge us to continue to stay steadfast in the faith. That no matter what the world can throw at us, no matter what problem or situation that we deal with, God, we will still with joy knowing who our Lord and Savior is. Father, I thank you for that. And I give you glory for that, Lord. In Jesus' precious name, amen. My phone's connected. Sorry. <laughs> I was about to start dancing up here. It's... All right, praise the Lord. Nobody ever had a phone go off in the middle of a service before today. Yeah. Uh, let's make sure our phones are on silent. I used to go on some, some meetings, you go on and it says they have a, a, a screen that says turn your phone off. But uh, I know some of you use it for your Bible because I encourage you to use that. So, James chapter 1, let's look at this. James was another name, let's look at the first word James. James, the brother of Jesus. This is who this James is. Just This book was uh, James is the same James if you will, that was uh, the pastor in Jerusalem. So you have James, John, James, and Peter were in charge of the church. Uh, Peter, James, and John were in the church, uh, charge of the church in Jerusalem. James was the half brother of Jesus. He was murdered or martyred for the for the for the faith in around AD 60. So this book was written probably around 40 AD, and you know Jesus. Um, uh, died when he was 33. So, you know, that time is one of the first books, or the earliest books written in the New Testament. Now, I like this book, James, because this is a pastoral type of book. All right, it's like, it's a book that, um, you know, you hear a pack, you know, from the heart of a pastor, he's speaking to the scattered church that left Jerusalem. He's trying to give them some instruction on what to do because they were persecuted at that time. So we see that the 12 tribes are scattered. They're persecuted because of their faith in Christ Jesus. I mean, Paul was killing Christians, right? Arresting them. So the church was in a little, a little disarray. You had the Roman government at the time. So things were a little messy. And plus, these were Jews that now were converted to Christianity. So they didn't have a lot of friends left in Jerusalem. So now, because of the persecution, we see that they were scattered all over. And then around AD 35, we see Stephen was even stoned. And who was that Stephen? Stoning, do you remember who was there? Paul. Paul was there. Yeah, or Saul was there, right? And so Saul was is responsible for writing most of the New Testament. So he was there at that stoning. So there was a lot of um, a lot of uh, confusion, a lot of uh, fear, there was a lot of things going on, but there's also some great faith happening, right? Because God was moving all over the uh, the area. And all over Jerusalem, all over the known world at that time, and thousands and thousands of people were being converted to Christianity at that time, or followers of Jesus. So we know that was happening at that time. In 
there's four main points in this book, um, or four main themes, if you will. One of them is the is writing, as James it, wrote it. It wasn't like a letter like Paul was always writing. He wrote a kind of defense of a fact. This is more like uh, Proverbs. You ever read Proverbs, anybody? You can take one line at a time, and it's truth, and you can apply it to your life, right? It's kind of what this is. It's like, you know, there's one, you can take one scripture, a couple words, and say, wow, I need to be like that, right? It says, if you look at it, it's consider it pure joy, you know, when you come under uh, trials and temptations. So that's, you can just stop there. I can preach right there for the rest of the day, trying to figure out what joy is. But that's what this book is about. It shows you. Uh, little truths, it's like a pastor, it's like me, it's how many been, well you guys been with me, you know, don't do this, right, don't do that, believe this, and I'm kind of pointed sometimes, it's kind of who I am, my character, I think uh, James was like me a little bit, that's why I kind of like this, don't do that, but God loves you, don't do that, Just keep the faith, don't do, right, and so he kind of, you know, it's kind of like that, you know, and he gives a lot of examples in the book, it's like, um, and it's also not even just, uh, it's kind of a pastoral exhort exhortation type of book. So don't do this, but if you trust God, this will happen in your life. Don't do this, but this is going to happen if you continue to believe. And so James, is, is, this book is like that. How, how to live, he's trying to encourage the new Christians how to live their life. Now how many of you like to know how to live a Christian life the way you're supposed to? I mean, they're like, he's giving some, some details about it. He, he, uh, he understood uh, what the new Christians were going through. He knew they were being persecuted for uh, their faith. Uh, socially, they were being uh, 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 persecuted. Economically, they lost their jobs. They left their homeland. Uh, there was a racism going on at that time. It was just a, they were persecuted for their religion. They were persecuted of uh, their spirituality. They didn't understand, maybe should I keep this faith? But he wanted to encourage them. Amen. He wanted to, he wanted to, this book is not really a book about theology, but how to do things. How to follow God. Amen? Um, he used the word brother. I just I did this this morning in my book. He used the word brother numerous times throughout this whole thing. So he's saying, here, do this, brothers. It was like family. Do this as a pastor. Here, I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters. Follow Jesus. Don't give up in the faith. Brothers and sisters. And he said it over and over. He gave a command, but then he said, brothers. He's like, hey, I, 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 want, you, I want you to know I love you. I care for you. You're my brother. You're my sister. I want you to follow after Jesus. Don't give up on the faith. The trials that you're going through and the things that are happening in your life right now is to bring you closer to Jesus. I understand that. I know it's hard what you're going through, but don't give up. Follow him. Amen. And love on him. He does a lot of imagery in this book. You see, you bridle the tongue. You know, your tongue can say things you shouldn't. It's like a, and it's, he gives an example of a ship. Of, he uses a bridle, like a, a, a horse, you know, the, the, the horse bridle. Uh, he also uses the rudder of a ship. You know, you say one thing and you can turn the whole ship by just by saying things. There's a lot of imagery in this book, just in the short book it is. And so it's good. I mean, he wants to make everybody understand what we're supposed to do and how to do it. Amen. And he does it in, a, in an encouraging way, but it's like, when I was, as I was rereading this over and over this week, I think, like, man, I, like, I was reading it for the first time. I was like, I didn't even understand this because I had to dig deeper into what he really meant. And I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. Let's go verse 1. Let's start with the, 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 the title of the sermon. Uh, for this sermon is Wisdom for Your Trials. We all go through trials. We all go through situations. It means, and we all go through bad stuff. Sometimes it's spiritual. I struggle with my relationship with God. How do I, I, I hear his voice? How do I know he's directing me? Or maybe it's a, it's a basic attack on your life because you're a Christian. And man, you, don't, you could lose your job or you could lose relationships in your family. All these things can happen in our lives. And Jesus, if you look at what oh, James is saying here, look at the first verse. It says, James, a servant of God. I'll get back to that a little bit later. And of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes were scattered. So we, we understand again, this was the church in Jerusalem that was scattered all over because of persecution. And in verse 2, it starts kind of his instruction. It says this, Consider it pure joy, or consider it all joy, my brothers. Let's stop right there for a minute. Consider it all joy, or wholly joyful in your situation. So what does it mean? Everybody should just walk around happy with smiley faces on and pretend that we're actually happy? Right? Don't we do that? We come to church, we're all looking like, hey, nobody knows my problem. We all shake hands. Maybe not in this church. I think we're getting to a point where we're not that way. I think because of our mission communities, we kind of like, we literally get to know each other's lives. But I'm just saying, for the most part, this is not an outward appearance. 
Joy. It's not the happy, I'm all happy because life is good, right? Joy. It's not about this. We have to go back, and, and I did a little bit of research. I'm not going to pretend to know everything in Greek or Hebrew, but I just went back and studied a little bit. What is this joy talking about? Because it, it doesn't seem so simple that I could be joyful because I'm going through a trial. It's not natural for me to be happy because I just lost my job, or I'm going through a divorce, or cancer came on me, or somebody persecuted me because of my race or my religion. No, that is just, how do I be joyful in that? But it's, he's telling us, he's a pastor, he, he has a heart for the people, and he's saying, be joyful. The joy that this, if you go out and study out, is the joy that in my heart, no matter what happens to me, I'm going to be happy because I know God. I know who I believe in, I trust in him, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to let the circumstances of my life change me. I'm not going to let that change the confidence of my face. I'm going to be joyful because I know who my hope is. I don't care what I go through in my life, there's joy, there's peace, there's happiness in me because I know my creator. That's what this joy is. So when he says joy here, it's not just, oh, be happy. And that's what sometimes we read our scriptures, we just kind of read over it sometimes. This joy is saying, hey, I know who my redemption is. I know who my Savior is. I know Him. And I, I, I don't care what, goes, what happened in my life, I'm going to trust in Him. That's the joy that this is talking about here today. How much joy do we have? Come on. So we're all going through stuff. God knows that, right? And then when you go through stuff, whatever it is, and we're not being persecuted, we're not scared, we're not losing our homes, we're not going through stuff that the early church did, but we're still applies to us today. We have to go through joy, have joy in our heart, because we know who He is. Say amen. This is awesome. I'm thinking to myself, that's not me. I'm reading this thinking, man, i got some stuff to work on. Because I get a little ticked off sometimes when things don't work right. Anybody with me? I get discouraged because it's just not the way it's supposed to be, or it's not perfect in this way. And I get a little upset about things. I'm thinking, where's my joy? Where's it comes out? Because what happens in the abundance of your heart, the mouth speaks. So when you're joyful and you're trusting in Jesus and everything, all of a sudden you're speaking things that look joyful or happy. Amen? And you spread the same thing out to the people around you. You can say, amen, I need that little bit of joy in my heart, right? Hallelujah, we do. We need to have joy. The joy is a trust in the Savior who died on the cross for me, who suffered and died, and was tempted in every way, and gave me victory over every temptation because He did it for me. I can do it also. Amen? Joy in my heart. I just read this. I thought, consider it pure joy. Pure joy. In one translation. In the Amplified Bible, it says, Consider it wholly joyful, my brothers, whenever you are enveloped in or encounter trials of any sort or fall into various temptations. No matter what you go through in life, consider it. Not consider it. Maybe that's not the right word. I will default to joy in my heart because I know that my Savior is going to bring me through the situation. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be happy. It's right here. And when people say, how you're going through this, people walk into our house or, you know, say things, you know, you walk into your house and say, oh, it's so peaceful here. Because Jesus is Lord over every situation, no matter what comes up, I'm going to trust my Savior, and that gives me joy. It gives me Peace. It makes me happy to know that even though I'm going through this difficult time in my life, there is something on that other. It's going to end. I am just reminded of uh, Psalms 23. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, don't blame. Even though I walk through this difficult time, even though I walk through cancer or or or, or races or, or or any difficult thing in my life, I'm going to walk. It's going to be. A, I'm going to be on the other side of this thing because God is going to take us through here because what He's going to do in me is so much greater if I just trust Him through this process. And that takes us to the next part of this verse. It says, uh, and when you face trials of many kinds. Sometimes we're not very open about the trials we're dealing with, economic, social, racism, uh, spiritual, or religious persecution, no matter what we're going through. You know, <laughs> Pastor James sent this letter to the church so they, he knew their mess and he knew what they were going through. And he was going to say, listen, you're going through this trial because God is going to perfect something in you if you just let him. 
It's like, um, I was, did anybody watch Forge? The TV where they make knives and, and swords and stuff? It's called Forge. Anyway, I like to watch it because they make things and I like making things. And so they take to, to in order to temper steel, they, they heat it up and they form it into whatever they're going to make, a knife or a sword or whatever, and they heat it up over and over, and they bend the metal over, and they bend the metal, they bend the metal, they bend the metal, and they forge it, they, 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 they uh, put it in the heat, and they bend it, and they till it's what they, what they want, a knife or a, let's say a sword. And then they take that sword and to temper it, they put it in uh, oil, and it does whatever the chemical reaction happens, and it's hard steel. That's what God's doing to us when we're in our trials. That's what this trial, this word trial here, that's what it means right there. It means God is taking us through the situation because on the other side, we're going to be strong. And the next thing we're going to study to talk about is steadfast in Him. We won't waver. We know who our redemption is. We look towards Him and Him alone in every situation. God is forging or making us into His image. And the trials that you go through, every one of them, I'm telling you today, every one of them is to take us through so on the other side we look like Jesus. Every one. I don't care what it is. Every situation in your life. I got pain in my body. I'm going through sickness. I got this uh, hard time. I'm trying to deal with this. Whatever it is, if you look at it, is God taking you? Pastor James was saying, God is taking you through this trial for a reason. And if you just stay steadfast in Him, I'm telling you, on the other side, we look more like Jesus. How many want to look more like Jesus? Amen. How many is going through some stuff today? Huh? We're going through things. We're going through hard times. We're going through, maybe we're not going through hard times. Give God praise for that. Some of us, maybe we're on the other side already. Maybe we've been through some stuff and now we're on the other side. Then you be the person that, 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 that cries out saying, Jesus is the way. Come and get close to him. He wants you to be like this. Bring all, all the people in our church family, all the people in our missional community. They're going through stuff. Right? And we should bring them through. We're discipling them. We're helping them be like Jesus. We're, we have passion. We have compassion upon them when they go through these trials and tribulations. So we want our church to look like Jesus. Amen? You know, I mean, I'm glad the guys said what they said. I, I'm glad they're following me, but I hope they're following Jesus. Amen? I'm glad. I, I love these guys. I, we went through some stuff. I mean, we got stories, you know, that we could write books and say, man, you would, when, when this person went through this or when this person went through that, we were there, we were on our knees crying out, God, help them through, help them through. We know what, if they just focus on Jesus and they keep their eyes on Jesus, he'll bring them through. I got marriage problems. I got financial problems. I don't have a job. I remember Dion coming in. I don't have a job. Well, let's trust Jesus. I don't know what else to tell you. I, I can't do a resume for you. He's already had a resume. You got him out everywhere, right? I can't, I don't, I can't do it. I remember saying to him, one time. I can't do nothing for you, brother. I don't have no, I don't know what else to tell you. Because let's pray and ask Jesus to help you, right? And it's Jesus. And on the other side of that, you know, I mean, we're not perfect still, but still we're going through everything for a reason. So we can be like him. Amen? Amen. I think also it's not only just a chance a change in our character. It's not a change, it's a change in our heart to be compassionate like Jesus is compassionate. Because when we go through those trials, we see somebody else going through, we say, oh, let me help you. Amen? Let me help you through this situation. You have a difficult time right now. I'm thinking of, oh, I'm just thinking of so many things that are happening in our country right now. I see so many Christians getting so stupid about stuff. I mean, Jesus, Jesus is the answer. Let's, let's get back focused on what, why we're going through all the stuff we're going through in our country, in our world. Because people are not coming to Jesus. And they're all messed up in their head right now. And I'm thinking, hey, Jesus loves you. We get back to Jesus loves you. You're going through this, this turmoil because guess what? You you might be all think you're all righteous and holy right now, but God's taking you through this for a reason. And we're going to be there on the other side saying, Come, it's Jesus. Jesus is the answer. Jesus loves you. Jesus cares for you. Amen? It's Him that we want to bring people to. That's what this is saying in the scripture. 1 Corinthians 16, uh, 13 through 14. It says, be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, don't hide who you are, stand firm in your faith, and it says, verse 14, I love God, I love the Holy Spirit, how he directed the writers to write this, the word of God. 
because Dion said it, or no, Angel said it, you have to do everything in love, right? Is it, turn there in your Bibles, would you do that with me? 1 Corinthians chapter 16, I want you to see this, because it's not just me. Um, chapter 16, verse 14, 13 and 14, sorry. Uh, and my Bible says, be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be men of courage, be women of courage, be strong, and verse 14, everybody underline this in your Bible, do everything in love. Do everything in love. I'm going through this process, I'm grumpy, I'm angry, I'm, I'm, God's trying to change me, I'm not happy about it, come on. Every time we go through something, or is that just me? And then all of a sudden I realized, wait, i got to stand firm on the Word. I know He loves me. He cares for me. He died for me. He gave me victory over everything in our life if we just trust Him. Stand firm in that. That's how you can have joy, is when we stand firm on the Word of God and nothing else. Amen? Nothing else. Oh, I have all this. Let me, I don't want to bash education, but I have all these experiences in my life. It tells me how to deal with these problems. That's great. But I'm telling you, even after that, you have to trust Jesus. Amen? Amen? You can go to the doctors, go to psychologists, go, go get all the help you need, get financial help, get help, whatever you need. But through all that help, the end result is Jesus is the answer for that problem. That's right. We have to trust Him. That's what Pastor James was saying here to the early church. You are persecuted. You lost everything. You're living in a tent somewhere in a desert because of what happened in Jerusalem. But you hang on to Jesus. You be a light where you're at. You share whatever you have. You love people and bring them to Jesus. Thousands of people came to Christ. Maybe that's what we need, a real persecution in the church. Maybe we have to just trust God more. Maybe we lose everything and then trust Him in that. We, you know, I don't pray that over anybody. I really don't. But I'm just saying, we have to trust Him. Whatever you're going through today, whatever sickness, whatever disease, whatever hard times, verse 4 says this. Perseverance, or in some Bibles it says steadfastness. So this one says perseverance in my Bible. Must finish its work so that you may be mature. We're always in a hurry. We're always in a hurry. The worst thing that ever happened to humanity is microwave. I mean, everything's warm. One thirty seconds, you got a hot cup of coffee, water, warm up your potatoes, boom, boom. Quick, 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 quick. Everything's quick, right? Especially in America, we have all gadgets. I mean, you can make pasta, you can make fresh coffee, you can make, you know, you got, you got even crock pot you can let cook. I mean, you got every instrument available to you. You got cars that go really fast, which I like. Um, I mean, we got everything. I mean, and then even in our cars, you can pick up your phone, you can text somebody. I mean, you can do, I mean, you know, it's all, it's, we got everything. We just get it fast, fast, fast. But this is what the Word of God's saying here. Let the testing of your faith develop perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work. Sometimes, when you're going through something, and then you're going through something, and then you're going through something, and then you're going through something, and you're going through something, God wants to change you. God wants to choose something in your heart. God wants to make you into His image. And you're going through this process over and over. Stand fast in that. Examine your heart. You ever get mad at God or is it just me? I'm going through, I'm getting a little, what are you doing this for again, God? Why am I going through this? Because your heart isn't right. You don't trust me. There's no joy in there. You're not standing firm. You're wavering back and forth. Do I trust God or not trust God? Do I handle this myself or do I really trust the Lord? We waver back and forth, and God says, no, stand firm in who Christ is in your life. Because God wants to work something out in you so you can look like Him in the world around us. That's the story. I can say, that's done. I'm done. It says this. It says, perfect work in some translations. 
God wants to do his perfect work in you. I'm just saying, let him finish it. I'm telling you, on the other side, it's so much joyful. Amen? And in the process, if you realize what God's doing here, in the process of what you're going through, he wants you to have joy. That's why Pastor James started with joy first. Consider it all joy, he said. Consider joy as you go through all these things. So let's look at his life for just a second, okay? Let's go back and just examine him. James was the younger brother of Jesus. Alright? Now think about that. Being Jesus' brother. I mean, he's walking on water. He's, you know, a little birdie dies. He heals it. I don't know what Jesus did when he was a boy. We know he was wise. Confounded to even the religious folks at the time. But I mean, he was his brother, right? Then we see in Mark chapter 3, verse 21. Let's turn, can you turn to Mark? This is James what he thought of his brother Jesus and his whole family, his mom and his brothers. Let's look at it, Mark. Uh, just, I, I, was, I was just laughing when I was reading this. <laughs> I thought, yeah, I could see my family doing the same thing to me when I came back from uh, North Carolina and came up, moved up here and they thought I was crazy. Come on, let's go to bar, Bob. You, know, just, you can just hang out there. You can just, you know, let's go smoke some weed. You know, they were just like, they wanted me to be the old Bob, you know. But God changed me, you know. They were grabbing, they were grabbing me and they wanted me to be, you know, just the same person. And this is like Jesus right here, Mark chapter 3. And you look at verse 21. It says, when his family heard about this, that he was healing people and, and people were, are coming and they're challenging him and he was confounding them. They're like, they're like, no, this guy's gone crazy. Look what he says. And his family heard about this. They went to take him, take charge of him, and they said, he's out of his mind. <laughs> like, this is our, this is Jesus, the carpenter's son. Let's, let's take him home, you know. Let's, and then look at the end, of the end of the chapter. It says, did Jesus' mother and brother arrive, standing outside? They sent someone inside the, the house to get him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, your mother and brother are outside looking for you. They're coming to get you to take you home because, dude, you're like, they think you're crazy. You went off the deep end. You know, something happened to you. You're, you're like nuts. What's going on? You were like that. You know, you came home, and you were supposed to be drinking and partying with me, and now you've changed, you know? But anyway, so then, uh, and then... Um, it says, uh, then Jesus said, who is my mother, who is my brother? He said, those around me that are following me, those are my brothers and sisters, and kind of confused people. But anyway, the point is that they, they thought Jesus was crazy. James thought he was nuts. <laughs> and then we see the same, the same James that said his brother was nuts. We see in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 7, it says that Jesus appeared to all these people after he, raised, he was rose from the dead he, he was resurrected he appeared to a bunch of different people and he also, it says in verse uh, 7 says he also appeared to James in a special encounter with his brother Jesus met with him, who knows what he said you know, I could imagine my brother raised from the dead and then he appeared to me and then Paul says he also appeared to him himself when after he appeared to James, we see next that James became the pastor, of, uh, one of the pastors of, of the church in Jerusalem. So they had three pastors there. We, we only have two right now, so maybe we'll have three eventually. Praise the Lord. I guess we have one, three, ten, and then, yeah. And then we see in James 1, let's go back to James 1. We see this really important identification of who James is. It says, James, look at James, verse 1. It says, James, a servant of God. And this word servant here, you can look it up in the, in the Greek. It says, it's, it's a reference to the word bond servant. Has anybody ever heard bond servant before? A person that willfully gives himself to serve under somebody else as a slave. I'm willing to go serve you. And you provide for them, you take care of them. Maybe it was a good, uh, a good situation or whatever. But he was willing. And that's what God's requiring of us today. <laughs> He's requiring a lot of us today, but 
He's a, we're bond servants of the Most High God. I mean, our life is like, 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 like James, if you will. We were, first, we were basically half brothers of God or Jesus. We weren't quite in the family yet. We were sinners. We were enemies of God. And then we believed one day. We had an experience where Jesus showed up. And we said, yes. I believe you are the Son of God. Same thing that James did. And then he called James to do something. And he's calling all of us today to do something for his kingdom. What is it? Pastoring, teaching, discipleship, being part of a national community, seeing our neighbors come to Jesus, giving our all, giving our finances, giving whatever we have for the kingdom of God to be advanced in Madison, Wisconsin. That's what God wants us to do. We can look down on your whole life right now. Am I a believer? Or how many, when you became, when people told you about Jesus, thought he was crazy? I can't be forgiven. I've done so much stuff in my life. There's no way I could be forgiven. And then I had a moment, an encounter with God, and I said, yes. And he wiped all my sins away. Amen. He took and washed them, and I was clean. I had peace. I had joy. I had, man. I told, one of the first things I told Tina after I became a Christian was, I walked outside, and I, the trees looked greener, and the sky looked bluer. My life was changed, and my, the way I looked at the world was different. I saw as a creator made it now. It was amazing. But the point I want to challenge you with today is when you go through all these things, when you go through your trials and tribulation, it's so we can mature in our faith. Now look at the verse 4. It says, Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. And I know some people misuse this verse like all the time. That means you can have a new car, a house, you know, some clothes, a nice watch, you know, whatever you're looking for. But that's not what it's saying. When it says mature in the faith, that means we lack nothing. We not nothing. We lack no faith to do whatever God told us to do. That's what it's saying. No, your faith will be increased. I trust God no matter what I'm going through. I trust Him. My faith is mature. I know my Savior. I'm standing fast on Him. I'm standing on the rock, Jesus. I know who my salvation comes from. I know where my salvation comes from. It comes from Him alone and nothing else. So whatever you go through in life, no matter what's happening right now, whatever, and what was interesting about this, if you mature in your faith and then you understand the calling of God, God's calling us to do something greater than ourselves so we can advance the kingdom of God. So I, now my, my maturity is I don't look for myself needs. I look for what God is calling me to do. And some of them in this room, we have all different education, backgrounds, things that, that God has blessed us with. So God's going to use you. Amen. He's going to use you if you say yes to him. So we say, well, J Pastor James is saying here, now look what he says here. He says, perseverance must finish his work. So we have to go through the trial. We have to get tempered. We have to go through the process. And once we go through the process, it's going to mature us in our understanding of who God is. Our hearts are going to be full of joy because even though I'm going through some stuff, I know God and who I believe and understand who he is. And then, when it's complete, we lack nothing because I'm telling you what happens is you don't care about stuff anymore. It's complete because I don't care if I have a big house and a beautiful kitchen and a better car. Those worldly things are out of my mind because now I think of only how do I advance the kingdom of God. That's what changes in our hearts. We lack nothing because we don't want anything else. A heart breaks when we see a person that needs Jesus. A heart breaks when we see a, church, a, a Christian immature in a relation with God, struggling over the same things over and over again. We need to get past that and stand on Christ. Amen? God's calling you and me to be mature in our relation with Him and then do something. Right? Okay, I'm good, I'm clean, I made it, I trust Jesus, now what? What am I? Okay, I'm here, I'm clean. Great, awesome, nice, 
Glad you overcame that finally. Praise the Lord. I've been praying for you. Awesome. Nice. Now what? Now what? You go through everything to mature you so you can follow him and advance his kingdom. That's why we go through all this stuff. That's why we go through it. There's no other reason. So what, what do you, Pastor, it's all, yes, this is all my life is about. At least I'm working towards it, like you are. Praise the Lord. Would you, um, Tina, would you come? I forgot the number of this one. So let's say, who are you trying to be? Are you trying to be a businessman? What if you lose your job? Marriage? What if your marriage falls apart? Kids? How many have kids? I mean, what if your kids are just totally rebellious? What if the worst thing happens to you? We have to trust Jesus. That's not a very happy sermon, but isn't that a happy I'm joy? Pastor, you said I have to have joy, and I just told me, what if I lost everything? Well, what if you lost everything? Who are you believing and trusting in? What is your hope in? Is it in your ability to do things? Yeah, God blessed you with that. Great, you know, do the, be the best whatever you do. But if you're not, let me take that. God's given you all that for his glory. Amen. And I believe it's time for us as a church to look at ourselves and examine and say, God, what do you want me to do?